The Access to Capital Educational Series, The Fundamentals of Startup Financing, is made possible by the generous financial support of the Truist Foundation. Access to Capital is an educational program of Verge and its affiliates. RAMP, the Regional Accelerator, Roanoke Blacksburg Technology Council, and its partners, The Launch Place, the Appalachian Council for Innovation, and Blue Ridge PBS. We are so fortunate to have with us Ford Kemper, principal with Woods, Rogers, Van Deventer, and Black, and also Mark Friedman, president of RTP Capital Associates and portfolio manager for The Launch Place, Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Thank you Good for morning. Thank you for being here. We're going to uh, be talking today about from term sheet to closing. Um, and we're just going to kick it off with Mark. Get us started on this whole process a little bit, just an overview of term sheet to closing. But you're going to start us off with term sheets. Sure. Thanks, Lisa. And glad to be here with you today. You know, term sheet, I like to look at as a blueprint. It's something that's going to be built on. And it takes various forms as you go from term sheet to closing. Initially, it could very well be something that the entrepreneur puts together, mm -hmm. that they want to see this level of terms. Ultimately, a lead investor comes in. They'll specify what the terms are. It's a blueprint of what they want to see in the final documents. At the end, the term sheet is what's going to drive the production of the documents. So it's really a guideline for what's going to go on as that entrepreneur is trying to raise funds, what's the valuation going to be? What's the type of security going to be? All the different parameters that go along with it. As we'll talk about a little bit as we go through this, the devil is in the details with it also. There are all kinds of things that are important points. And we're not going to go through all of them because it could take days to talk about all the different points. The easy ones are what's the value? What kind of security is it? But there are other things that an entrepreneur really wants to understand as they go through this, that they want to talk to an attorney such as Ford and make sure they see what all of the different things are, because ultimately it's going to end up in the documentation. And if you have a signed term sheet, if it's not what you think it's going to be when you get that documentation, all of a sudden you see it in the documentation, it's too late. Mm. So uh, you said something that and piqued my interest here, um, that the term sheet is is usually started by the entrepreneur and what that person wants to see in it. I'm wondering about expertise like you and Ford being involved at that age and stage with the term sheet. Yeah, it's not usually set up by the entrepreneur. It can be set up by the entrepreneur. Gotcha. Very often, it's when you start getting investment terms from somebody that's interested in investing, they'll put together the term sheets. But that entrepreneur should at least have an idea of what they're looking for. You can't just go in and say, I want to raise money. You don't have any idea what your valuation should be. You don't have any idea if you want to raise stock or, or a convertible note or some other form. So you have to have an idea of what that is. So you might have just a very summary term sheet as the entrepreneur to start with. It's going to get uh, expanded on by that investor and changed and negotiated. Ford, you were going to say something? Yeah, and yeah, it, uh, and I, I'm Ford Kemper, again, uh, chair of our Emerging Growth Group, and I do a lot of securities and IP, uh, venture and angel financing, and of course, mergers and acquisitions. Um, a term sheet, which can be signed or unsigned, um, just like an MOU or a letter of intent, uh, is generally not binding, and it's just, it's an easy way to agree on the key terms of the investment before you turn to all the agreements. So frankly, that's an efficient way to do almost any transaction, but certainly in this case. And as Mark said, uh, sometimes uh, the, the company will have an idea of how it, what it wants to do and how it wants to raise, and it'll go forward with the term sheet. And a lot of times it'll have conversations with a lead investor like BTC Seed Fund, and the fund will do the first draft of the uh, term sheet. And like Mark said, it actually is really important, but it's just like, a, just like a letter of intent for an acquisition. There are a lot of details that you can get in there in your favor at the term sheet stage that later on you won't be able to get into the mm. draft document. And that's because once the, well, take a step back, most deal documents are done by the investor if it's a, a fund or something like that. Um, if it's just angels, it might be done by a company counsel. 
But if it's a fund, once the fund hands that to the lawyers to do the first draft, they're pretty much going to stick with what they normally do. So if you, a company, want to do anything a little bit, quote, off market or custom, you got to get in the term sheet. So that brings up another question, which is, what should the entrepreneurs be doing um, to prepare for this, this stage of having a term sheet? Is there work that they should be doing in advance or research or something so that they can be conversant in this space? Well, yes. Well, I think listening to a show like this is actually a great start. At least I hope it will be. But, and not to be too basic, but it starts from the very beginning when you start a company. When you start a company, you want to get a CPA. You want to do everything right from the beginning. You need to be careful about documenting who has equity. You don't need a Facebook situation where two twins are saying they own a piece of the company. Um, you don't want to have offer letters that offer percentages to employees of equity. So the best thing you can do is from day one, plan for success. Because whether it's a venture capital investment or an acquisition, the buyer or investor is going to come in and look at everything from day one. And if there are problems, uh, they're going to dig deeper and maybe pay less or maybe not write a check at all. Yeah. What do you think, Mark? Yeah, I, I agree with that completely. It's, it's as much starting to get ready to sell securities in your company, whatever that form is. You want to have your act together when you go out. And you know, let's go back to what we were talking about before with who puts together the term sheet and when. If it's the entrepreneur putting together a term sheet before they have investors, it's generally the entrepreneur saying, this is what I'd like to get for my terms. It's what price I want to set. If it's the investor coming in, it's the investor saying, this is what I'm willing to buy, what mm -hmm. I'm willing to invest at. So very often that initial term sheet is just, a, it's, it, it's a wish list from the entrepreneur. So oh, okay. Often you're getting that investor that's coming in that's setting the terms. That investor comes in and says, this is what we're going to be willing to invest. It's a series of discussions that are going to be had with that entrepreneur beforehand. And that's part of the preparation to getting that term sheet. So that entrepreneur has to have a deck together. They have to have their story in line. They have to have information about their team. Transparency is really critical. They need to be able to be upfront. You know, as Ford was saying, you're going to, if you have somebody that's interested, you're going to go into diligence. And the biggest reason diligence falls apart is that you start looking at things and it's very different than what the entrepreneur mm -hmm. represented. It's not that they're going to find fraud or something like that. It's just that the entrepreneur stretch the truth more than they're comfortable with because they get in their heads sometimes that I have to make this look better than it is. Well, it's going to actually make it look worse than it is more right. times than not. Is that what you've seen, Ford? Yeah, I agree. And, uh, you know, diligence is when they come in and they want to look at all your documentation and contracts, your IP licenses, and what have you. And, and in, good investors or lead investors will do that. But the one, Mark made me think of one important thing, which is the company has to figure out how much money they need to implement their growth plan until the next inflection point. And by that, I'm not just trying to use lingo, but most startup companies need to raise money now. And if they're successful, they're going to need to raise money again. So talking to people like Mark and your advisors um, and mentors about how much you realistically need to get to that next point is very important. And many companies start out this process of not knowing whether they need a half million or a million and a half. And I think that's very important for the company. And Mark, I'm sure that's what every investor wants to know. This is why I need it and how I'll spend it and to get to, get to here. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, four points is something really valuable for entrepreneurs, especially at the early stage. Angel investors in particular want to help that company. It's part of the reason they're investing. Obviously, they want to invest in something they feel good about and something they're able to make a return on ultimately. But they want to be able to also mentor that company very often. And they could sit down with the entrepreneur and talk about what should go into your term sheets. What should mm -hmm. you be looking at? Should you be having convertible debt? Should you be having equity at this point? Should you consider something else? Those are all really critical things. So one of the things we've tried to do is have educational sessions where we have both entrepreneurs and investors to Together, so you can hear both sides of the coin, because the idea that those discussions have to be adversarial is very dangerous and very mm. wrong. Say you more wanna... about that when you say say more about that, because I think there often are times where people feel that they're in some sort of adversarial relationship. Well, I think I think 
in general, if you have an adversarial relationship with who you're going to be taking investments from, you probably should try to walk away from that investment. Mm -hmm. You want to find a partner that's going to be a partner, whether it's an investment partner, a commercial partner, whatever it might be, you're going to be with that person, that group for a long time. And it could have dramatic impacts on how you build your business, what the thought of going forward might be. You know, for instance, if an entrepreneur is looking for investment dollars and they think, you know, I'm the greatest entrepreneur on the planet. This is an early stage company, but I know I could take this company, be a hundred million dollar company and have it as a public offering. If that investor thinks this is an early stage entrepreneur, I love his enthusiasm, her enthusiasm, the dedication they have, but there's no way that this person is going to be able to take this company past $5 million in revenue. Mm -hmm. You need to have those discussions up front because when you get closer to that point, the investors are going to be looking at bringing somebody in potentially to take the business to the next stage. You as the entrepreneur had your dream set that you're going to run this company all the way. So those are things that you should really have those conversations with. They're not specifically things that go into the term sheet, but once those terms are developed to get to closing, know that you're going with the right investor and the investor is going with a company that matches their ideals. Those are critical discussions. Yeah, that Mark, that comment reminds me of something Ford said earlier, which is with the term sheet, you want to, you want to be thinking and preparing for success, but this is part of that thinking, isn't it? And, one of the things I wanted to mention when Mark talks about that is if you are having these discussions with a potential investor, um, the angel investors around here and where Mark are, you know, their hearts are in a good place, but you want to have an idea of what type of offering or what type of security you may issue before you have that conversation, because it may be that the investor has ideas that maybe don't perfectly align with yours. So although it may, it may sound a little self-serving, I encourage you to sort of talk to your lawyer about how you want to frame that conversation so it doesn't go sideways. For example, I had a startup company talking to a potential lead investor, and their big goal was to make them convert to an LLC so they could get operating losses. Well, that's pretty, that's pretty idiosyncratic, I think you'd say, Mark, and you shouldn't necessarily let the tail wag the dog unless it makes sense for everybody. Yeah, I, you know, that's a great example. And I, I agree with Ford completely that attorneys play a very, very important role in this. And it's not just the attorneys. One of the things we talk about all the time is that you have to have an attorney that understands early stage investing. And we've heard many times from somebody, yeah, I'm going to have my paperwork done by my uncle Joe, who is a divorce attorney, but he said he'll do this for free for me. Well, that's a fundamental mistake because mm-hmm. uncle Joe probably is a great divorce attorney, and he may know a little bit about early stage investing, but he probably doesn't know the nuances that Ford was just talking about. So for instance, the example Ford gave, the company wants to set themselves up as an LLC because somebody told them you could take, you have great tax benefits from this if you set it up as as an LLC to start with. Most investors don't want to have an LLC that they're putting their money into because you're going to get a K-1, a tax form at the end of the year, and you're going to have passive losses that you can't use. And the K-1s are always late and it delays everybody's tax return from being filed. So those are really important things that the entrepreneur needs to understand. They can hear it from the investor. They can hear it from their attorney. But if they come out and they don't understand that when they first start negotiating the term sheet with an investor, they can't really represent themselves well as a no. company trying to raise And Mark, a quick, a quick horror story. We had a, a client that's been very successful that has about 120 members in the form of an LLC. Can you imagine what happened when they had to amend their 2019 taxes? All 120 members had to amend their 2019 taxes. And uh, uh, angel investors don't like that. <laughs> yeah, well, there, there's another thing that goes on with LLCs that people don't often think about, and that it might it might force the people that get the K-1s to have to file taxes in another state. When the investor realizes that, they're not terribly happy about it. Yeah, these are, <laughs> these are great cautionary t- tales, guys. What I'm wondering about, you, you're talking a lot about the entrepreneurs understanding the investors and the investors understanding the entrepreneurs, rent, that, that communication. Um, What's the need around understanding the requirements for accredited investors? Let's talk a little bit about that. Tell, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I'll give you yeah, the short I'm, answer. Mike, Mark. Let, let me give the yeah. short answer. For, for, Ford's the attorney. He can give you the real answer. The short answer is 
accredited investors are what's needed. There are some exemptions for, for people that are insiders, family members, things like that. But there's so there's so often people that are non-accredited investors that help somebody by giving them some money at the beginning of the um, investment that you have to unwind. Ford, what are the, the provisions? Well, accredited investors is essentially a proxy for who the SEC thinks needs to be protected and doesn't need to be protected. So accredited investors are folks that may make a certain amount of income or have a certain amount of assets. And once you are above that point, the SEC lets companies raise money from them really quite easily without a lot of paperwork. So in general, I pretty much only do offerings to accredited investors because there's not a big informational requirement and basically it's the gold standard of how to raise funds. Now, when someone uncle, someone's uncle who's not accredited wants to come in and invest, um, it can spoil your whole offering unless you do it very carefully. So if you're raising Series A from a bunch of accredited investors, thus getting this uh, gold standard exemption from securities laws, uh, if you got to take some money from your uncle as well, you don't do it at the, in the form of Series A that you're raising around the same time frame, or it blows your whole exemption uh, for your primary offering. So you do have to be careful, but there are plenty of workarounds as long as you know the rules and plan ahead. So how do, you, to, how do you decide on what type of security to offer, you know, when you're going through this process? That's, and that's not just a great question, but it's in the area where Mark and I may have a little bit of difference of uh, what we see a lot. So I'm, Mark, I'm going to not pick on you, but why don't we have a little bit of pros and cons here? Because the two primary differences is, are you going to do a priced round, meaning you and the investor agree you're worth X dollars, say $5 million as a pre-money valuation. What's your worth before they invest? Once you decide on a pre-money valuation, then you can do a price round and issue shares of stock that you know you can calculate the purchase price because you know what the pre-money valuation is. And then, and then you're generally deciding whether to have common stock or what I'll call fully loaded Series A or what I might call Series A light, which is preferred stock where you have certain uh, preferences and rights that common stock don't have but you know, there are various levels of how complicated you make that. On the flip side, it, you can issue a convertible note, which is really a way of punting your valuation. So let's say there's a company coming out of the Fraylin Biomedical Research Institute. They have an incredible potential uh, technology, but it's so early, how do you put a price tag on it? So the thing about convertible notes is where you have a situation where you know the company is going to have to raise money in the future, and it's hard to figure out whether it's worth a half million or 10 million, which it is hard, for example, with the technology coming out of a research institution, for example. In a convertible note, they're basically investing, um, and then the valuation is kicked to the next time they raise money. So if I do an angel round of 750000 in convertible notes, the investor will be a creditor that comes before stock. You might, you'll get an interest rate, you get a time value of money. And then if your note converts into say a series A round in two years, then you basically are priced at that time, but you get a discount uh, depending on um, you know, what you negotiate. And, and Mark, maybe you can talk about it. Maybe you can also talk about the fact that uh, why investors like valuation caps and notes, because I know that it's probably more important to you than me on this company side. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a few different perspectives. First of all, uh, this may surprise you, Ford, but I agree with all that you just said. I think that's all 100% accurate. But I also think there's more to the story from the, invest, from the investor side and probably from the entrepreneur side that has to be taken into account. So first of all, from an investor point of view, if you have a company coming out and uh, they want to issue a note because they don't know what that value should be today. From an investor side, you have to look at it and say, okay, you want me to invest today. You want my money today, but you want to determine that value when you build substantially more 
in the next year, two years, and you could justify a higher value. And you're going to give me a 20% discount for investing that way. So you're getting my money now, but I'm going to pay for what your value is a year from now at 20% less. And these are all important pieces of the term sheet because this defines all of it. It's after the negotiations. Well, I, as an investor, have to look at it and say, okay, your business is really worth zero right now because you want me to give you the money at the highest risk point, but you want me to get a 20% discount from when you might succeed two years from now, and it's going to be worth $5 million. So is it worth it for me to take that higher level of risk today for that 20% discount two years from now? That's a very important point that you have to be able to determine and you decide whether you want to invest in that note. So Mark and yeah. Ford, you're, you're, you're touching on a point that's important to all the entrepreneurs that we work with is, how do you negotiate the term sheet? How do you handle these things? Um, clearly Ford said there's, you know, there's different viewpoints, whether it's coming from the lawyer or the investor side. How, how would you advise anybody to negotiate a term sheet? Well, I think there's different strategies that are involved. And part of it depends on, A, how much you need the money right then. Mm -hmm. And B, how valuable is that investor to you? If they're an investor that's the greatest investor for you, they're a strategic investor, they're somebody that can help you build your business, whatever that might be, you're going to be willing to negotiate your terms much more than if it's just you know, some angel investor off the street that likes your idea and wants to put some money in. Also, how much is that person willing to put in and what can they bring to the table? Can they bring other investors? So yeah. you know, as we said before, transparency is a really important piece of this. You want to be able to sit down with who that investor is and say, these are the reasons that I think your valuation is too low. Generally, all evaluation means is how much stock is that entrepreneur? What percentage of that company is that entrepreneur giving up? And to get back to Ford's point yeah. about convertible notes, that's one of the main reasons that the entrepreneurs want to have a convertible note at a certain point because the valuation will be much lower. They have to give up a bigger part of their company yeah. because of that, where they can wait till they prove out their model. So for me, going back yeah. to the, the question right before this, the question of whether you have a convertible note is based on several things. First of all, how willing are you going to be and how prepared are you to actually have a priced round at the time that that note is going to be current. And if you see all the time somebody comes out with a convertible note that has a two-year term, but they don't have any real solid plans for when they're going to raise that A round. And if that's the case, they get to the end of the two-year term, you've got all kinds of issues because you've got a bunch of maturing notes. So those are things that have to be dealt with up front. Well, and, and to expand on that, um, and that's a very good point, but doing the math a little bit, let's say you're a new company with a promising idea, but you're all you have is a phase one research grant. You put in a proposal for a phase two, but you're a long way from market. You need to raise a half million dollars. Well, if you do a price ground and have a 500 grand valuation and raise a half million, you've given up half your company. And, and Mark is right. When you're so early like that, you're sort of a, you've got a great technology, a great idea. There's no way to know whether it's worth a half million or five or 10 million. Um, in, in some circumstances. And that's where, um, that's where I might advise convertible note. Now, quick technicality, in Virginia, there's a very attractive tax credit available for offering stock or convertible notes. But one detail is your convertible note has to be subordinated to any bank debt and have at least a three-year term. So that's just a quick thing to be aware of that's independent of when it might otherwise come due and need money. But one thing Mark said that does ring true is only only one angel investors. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, angel investors have so much risk and a lot of a lot of folks that are trying to make money realize it's a lot easier to make money the later you're investing, whereas early it's a real leap of faith. You're helping companies you want to see succeed, but you don't know what's going to happen. And getting a 20% discount to a pretty high valuation a year and a half later, when much of the risk has been removed, that's not that much juice. Now, sometimes I'll say, well, raise the interest rate because that's going to be a higher time value of money. That rewards it. But the place that investors say, listen, if you get bought for $200 million, first of all, I'm super happy. But if I'm only... If I'm only getting a 20% discount when someone invests 
than you at a $200 million valuation, that's not nearly enough juice to reward me for the risk I had by investing so early. So they'll say, no matter what happens in that next round, we're not going to let, we're going to pretend like the valuation in the next round is no greater than, say, seven and a half million. And that's called a valuation cap. And, you know. So how do you determine you that know, valuation? That's, that's, how, do, how, how would you advise the entrepreneurs to determine valuation? Because it is a tricky thing, right? Mm-hmm. I'm going to let Mark answer that because to me, it's a lot more of a dart throw than it is a calculation for a, for a company, say, with an in-licensed protein that uh, someday may, you know, cure eye disease. Yeah, oh, I totally agree that it's a dart throw. You can't determine what that number should be by any kind of realistic mathematical formula. And, and honestly, for most early stage companies, none of the mathematical formulas mean all that much anyway. So they're great to be able to put down on paper, but you're going a lot with gut feeling for that marketplace the entrepreneur is convincing you exists, that they can tackle it and the value of that entrepreneur. So the cap, the, the amount of the cap is really a critical piece because it's generally seen as what the valuation is going to be for the next round. Mm-hmm. Plus, it, and, and that's a misstatement because it's not, it's totally independent of what that next round is going to be, mm-hmm. but the investors see it, that this is what they're going to try to offer. And the entrepreneur gets that in, the, in their head that that's what they need to achieve. So it, it sets a bogey that may or may not be an appropriate bogey. The other thing with it is that, and, uh, go ahead, for. Oh, I just to say, the other thing it shouldn't be seen as is the pre-money valuation. The, the cap or ceiling shouldn't be, in my opinion, the investor's best get at what you're worth right now. That it's supposed to be a ceiling, not a point-in-time valuation. It, it shouldn't be, but it is perceived that way. Very, probably more. I know. Probably <laughs> more often than not. I, I totally agree with you about that. So you then have another issue that sits there that I think a lot of entrepreneurs miss. Convertible notes are debt. They have certain provisions that are built into them. If it's a two-year note, you need to have an event in two years because at the end of two years, you have to have that raise that's quali- that's um, you know the qualified raise. At the end of that two-year period, you have shareholders that either have to agree to extend their note. They can force the note to be cashed in. They're also accruing a good bit of interest at that point. Is the cap going to be extended that much longer at the same level? So there's another whole round of negotiations where the note holders really have the leverage. Now, in honesty, they don't really have the leverage because all they can do is say, we're calling the note. And what we do is put the company out of business because the company doesn't have the the money to pay it off. So it's just a situation you want to avoid. And I've seen all kinds of situations where those notes become mature. Actually, you've seen lots of situations where people don't keep track of the date that it matures. And six months afterwards, they say, hey, you were supposed to convert my note. And then there's also other provisions that are built into those that get detailed in the term sheet, such as what happens if there's not a qualifying event. Very often, you'll see something that says a majority of the note holders can cause us to convert at a certain level. People, when I said at the beginning, the devil is in the details on a convertible note term sheet. That's a really important detail that people don't often pay mm-hmm. attention to. So, Mark, I'm going to yeah, sure um, ask you to answer a question that maybe Ford thought he was going to answer first, but I'm going to ask you, which is, um, how important is it to have an attorney involved in this process and how early on should we have an attorney? And then, Ford, you can, you can say whether you agree or not with Marcus' <laughs> assessment on that. <laughs> well, I know if I say it's important to have the attorney on really early, Ford's going to agree. <laughs> so, but I actually really believe that. I think it's critical to either have somebody that's gone through this process you know, somebody that's an investor that's willing to work with you as a mentor and guide you through the process or have an attorney that's knowledgeable and help you with that process. Every investor you're going to bring in has experience investing and they have attorneys and they know what these things should be. Most reasonably good investors and honest investors and the vast majority of angel investors fall into that category. If you see a set of terms from an entrepreneur that hasn't been well thought out or is going to hurt that entrepreneur, they're going to sit down with you and say, you need to rethink this. You're hurting yourself with this term. And it's great for me as an investor. Do you really want to do that? You don't need to do that. So that that's really important. And an attorney for that entrepreneur will point that out if it's an attorney that's skilled in this. What do you think, Ford? 
Well, you know, I was just speaking at the Accelerator Ramp yesterday, and I, I also think CPAs are important from the very beginning. But there is, um, as a corporate lawyer, uh, and I guess it's great if a client hands me an already done term sheet or letter of intent for an acquisition because I'm going to do it. It's good for them and a good transaction. But it, it kills me because there's always some things you can get or win in those non-binding term sheets that uh, you've you lost the opportunity to get. So, it, and it may be sort of on the margin, but um, that's really the time for you to negotiate a little bit with your lawyer in the background so that you, you're acting like you're sort of just doing business terms when in fact, you know, you're kind of angling for some legal terms too. So I do think it's very important, and um, I, uh, and I appreciate, of course, Mark Mark saying that it's uh, um, you know it is it is it's fun to win points in a term sheet because uh, you know you can't win them later on, um, especially because if there's a fund, for example, the investment committee may approve the term sheet, so anything that's off market that's not on the term sheet they're not going to make any change because it would be different than the expectation of the investment committee, for example. So That's Mark funny. said something that you, Mark, you said that um, the investors will have attorneys. I think that's part of this process. The entrepreneur needs to understand why they need an attorney is because the investor is going to have attorneys on their side, right? Yeah. And I, I would tweak a little bit of, of what Ford just said. He said, it's nice to win points in a term sheet. I don't see it as winning points. I see it as a good partnership is going to have points that both sides can be happy with. So there are things that are going to be investor friendly. The investor can explain why they want that, you know, rights to future terms, uh, things like that, registration rights, uh, tag along, grab along. There's a zillion different terms. I actually teach a course, the End of Capital Association. It's a two hour course going over the details of term sheets. To me, it's as important for the entrepreneur to understand what that lawyer is going to be advising them as it is to have the lawyer. You don't want the lawyer just saying this, this, and this. You as the entrepreneur have to understand what those terms mean and what you're willing to live with as the entrepreneur, what you're willing to give yeah. up, what you're going to insist that you have. The lawyer is going to tell you all of the different things you can have, but you need to have a fundamental understanding. You, know, you go back to one of the initial questions, what should somebody do before they get a term sheet? understand the process. Mm -hmm. There are videos available. The Angel Capital Association has tons of information available for both entrepreneurs and investors. Do your homework on that and understand it. Talk to people that have been through the process. So what should be yeah. in the term sheet and, if it's equity? Well, I just want to follow up and then I'll sort of answer that, which is, uh, I just think that some commonly used language uh, is a little bit of a blunt instrument and needs to be fine-tuned to be fair between the two parties. Just because some language is market doesn't mean it's really the best language. Um, in terms of ambiguity or traps the unwary or mathematical fairness. Um, and I will say one thing before talking about what goes in for equity is when you get a term sheet from an investor that's nonsense, that's a lot of information you just received because it, it just tells you you're dealing with someone that, uh, you know, kind of probably full of bull manure. And, and Mark will tell you, those usually don't get to closing. They're just a distraction from the fundraising you should be doing. Wouldn't you say, Mark? And it, those almost never close. And once someone comes in with a nonsensical offer, uh, that's not going to close. I saw one time, Mark, somebody's term sheet included a personal guarantee from the founder. <laughs> what does that tell you? That tells you something that shouldn't be in there. <laughs> you know, the, the genesis of investing like this is that it, it, companies used to go out and get bank debt. Bank debt always required a personal guarantee on things. And it was always a very difficult conversation for an entrepreneur to go back to their spouse, you know, back in the old days, typically a male going back to talk to their woman or their, their woman, their third wife and saying, uh, you know, honey, we need to put our house up for, uh, uh, as a guarantee on this, on this debt. 
and that didn't fly. It really, it really stifled investment. So venture capital came along and equity investments where you don't have those personal guarantees. So if there's a personal guarantee in that term sheet, you probably want to run. Now, one of the things that I think Ford has probably <laughs> run into, um, and you see this a lot, are term sheets that are put together by people just cutting and pasting different term sheets. They take the terms from all the term sheets, stick it into one. It's kind of like throwing everything out there and seeing what sticks. That's not a good term sheet. So it's uh, it takes a lot more to get that right and make it a valuable thing than uh, than having a term sheet that's, that's good from the start. And if their term sheet tells you right off the bat that they, they don't know the market, that's just a bad sign. Um, and you had asked about what's in an equity offering, what type of terms, right. and, and to put it, put it simply, um, whether it's common or preferred, uh, pre-money valuation, uh, whether the investor wants you to create an option pool, which is for equity to future employees, which sounds generous, but really it just comes out of the founder's hide and mm-hmm. lowers the effective purchase price per share. Uh, a big one, and maybe the most important one uh, we should talk about is liquidation preference. When in common stock, if you have 100 shares outstanding and you get acquired, you split the money 100 ways. Uh, of liquidation preference is at, at the most basic level, and I'm going to be marking up the term sheet to do this in just a second. At the most basic level, a preferred should get their money back plus any accrued dividend, say 6% a year or 8%. Um, but if they would make more money than just getting their money back plus dividends, just being a common stockholder, because all preferred stocks convertible into common, um, that's probably the most favorable to the company. Um, but for example, what I'll be marking up after this call, they got, they wanted four times their money back and then, uh, split the money like they're a common shareholder. So if you had a, um, so basically, they want four times their money back plus dividends, and then they would be split it 100 ways after that's taken out of the pot. So you can see how that, that would be really painful for the founders and any earlier investors. But Mark, maybe you can talk a little bit of what you see, um, see in the market on liquidation preferences, because obviously the riskier the market out there, the riskier the company, you know, the more the investors can fairly say, I need to juice up my return because you're so risky. Yeah, I'm glad to talk about that. And, you know, what Ford was describing is something that's called participating preferred, not just standard preferred. And I think one of the realizations entrepreneurs come to at some point that they should know as they go into this process is that investors almost always require some type of preferred stock. And the basic philosophy that an investor has with that is that we're investing our hard-earned dollars If there's a sale of the company, we get our money back first. If you make money on it, you get to participate too. But if you didn't, you you caused the company to fail, you don't get your money back. And that's a tough thing for an entrepreneur to hear for the first time. I think Mm -hmm. they get to understand that if they have the right partner, they know that they're bringing value. And that's why they do that. But it's something that really needs to be understood. You know, what Ford was describing this 4X participating preferred, that would be an outlier. Typically, you don't see participating preferred that much anymore. Uh, it's usually viewed as double dipping. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm an angel investor. I, I, this is what I do for fun, but I actually have a full-time job also. <laughs> and we're raising funds right now, and we have a 3X participating preferred. And there's reasons for that. And um, it, it, it's generally in companies that are raising money at a later stage. You have to have a participating preference for some other reason that's sitting there. And you can usually justify it and understand what the ramifications of it are. But if you think from an entrepreneur's point of view, if you have three or four X of the invested dollars that have to come out upon a sale before those investors are then going to participate pro rata with the common shareholders, the employees, the option holders, the founders, there's going to be a lot of money taken off the table at the very start of that liquidation preference. So those are critical things in a term sheet that has to be understood. And again, you go back and think from the very beginning, the term sheet is just a blueprint. All the term sheet is doing is memorializing the negotiations that go into the various terms. So it's not that it's on the term sheet, it's that this is what's been negotiated and you need to understand it before that term sheet has it codified. Yeah, so I want to, I want to yeah. work because we're getting close on time. And I, I want to make sure that we get this last part in here is 
moving from the term sheet to a deal close. Uh, Ford, you said you can come in with things in a term sheet that really communicate to you right away that this probably isn't going to make it to a close. So, you know, talk a little bit, each of you, about moving from a term sheet to a deal close, because everybody wants that deal close, right? Yeah, and it, once you have a negotiated term sheet, um, it's actually a lot simpler than it sounds. Um, the documentation is relatively uh, typical. Um, again, if you don't if you don't get some points in the term sheet that I'll say are fair to both sides, uh, it you know it's it's hard to move off the quote standard language. But in general, the investor is going to look into uh, will have done due diligence. They may have already done it behind that they do the term sheet. There's a purchase agreement, um, but there's not a lot of there shouldn't be a lot of money spent on legal fees for of what I will call a angel financing, a convertible note offering, which are very efficient, um, and even a even what I'll call a Series A light should be able to be done pretty efficiently, so that you you negotiate the document, you sign it, you fund, and then you make your requisite filings with SEC and the state. Um, so it's not as laborious um, as you might expect. Later stage, you're doing a Series B or Series C at an $80 million valuation. Uh, there's going to be very much the level of diligence and work that you might expect in an acquisition where uh, you have a purchase agreement, you have the reps and warranties uh, of the company, which is just your way of saying you're not selling a pig in a poke, but it takes about 15 pages. Um, and then often in a later stage investment, the investor will want you to schedule out all sorts of information, all your employees, whether they're uh, exempt or non-exempt, are they, what's the immigration status? What are all your licenses? Um, that gets burdensome because it's adding almost like a full-time job onto an entrepreneur who's already probably working 150%. But early stage, um, I, unless you have what I'll consider to be a, a lawyer on the investor side that's quote, overdoing it, it, it shouldn't be that burdensome or hard to get to closing as long as they don't find anything, you know, dead bodies in the closet. Mark, what do you yeah. think? How do we get to a close? Well, I agree with what Ford said. It shouldn't be that difficult, but it often is. And, uh, you know, you go back to, again, the beginning, the devil is in the details. One of the things that the entrepreneur and the investor both have to be careful about is that those documents correctly memorialize what was agreed to in the term sheet. And as careful as people are getting this information prepared. Now, Ford doesn't want to hear this, but lawyers do make mistakes every once in a while. And it's it's fairly often that you find those mistakes. Mark, after, other lawyers. Other yeah, lawyers, yeah, you, right. You, other you, lawyers. You, you Sorry, forgot Ford. one word in there. Correct, correct. <laughs> um, but it's very often you find this down the road when you're trying to figure something out um, and you have to do some kind of transaction. The other thing that I would point to is, and Ford talked about this in later stage transactions, a lot of the complications are changes to prior rounds that need to be made. It's not uncommon common for a later stage investor to come in and say, we need to change some of the things that existed earlier on. And it's regardless of whether there's changes or not, you have to get shareholder approvals, board approvals, you have to file different things. So, you know, Ford looks at it because he does this all the time as relatively straightforward. But for an entrepreneur who's only doing it once, twice, three times in the history of their company, especially when it's the first time, it's a very, very um, time consuming and burdensome process. And you need to have people that you can trust and rely on that can help you through that process. You know, I have a general rule. I, I've read lots and lots of legal documents. I, I'm not a lawyer, Ford is. You know, I stayed in the Holiday Inn Express last night, so I'm a lawyer from that, but that's about it. And I could read legal documents, but when it comes to notwithstandings, if there's more than two notwithstandings in a document, I say my lawyer has to tell me what that means because it means this, 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 and this tracks back to here. And the documents all reference other points. Lawyers are trained. That's one of the biggest things they do in law school is train them how to interpret documents. What does a comma mean? I had a lawyer who told me the single most important character in the English language for legal documents is a comma because it changes things depending on where the comma is placed. So it's a critically important piece of that final puzzle. All right, guys. I think, um, Ford, unless you would like to offer some closing comments, we're, we're probably going to 
not be able to cover all the things we would love to cover <laughs> because there's so much uh, to explore on these topics of getting from a term sheet to a close. But we're, we're about ready to wrap up. Ford, any last words? And Mark, any last words for our audience? It, well, I'll just, I'll just remind folks that if you do a price round, you're generally going to be giving some veto rights to the investors. That's to protect them. Um, but it's something you need to know going in. And maybe Mark can end on whether or not uh, he sees the most angel in Series A light rounds or Series seed rounds having ending up with an uh, investor being on the, the board of directors. Oh, sure. It's a, it's a great question. Um, a lead investor will almost always ask for either a board seat or an advisor role. Entrepreneur has to be careful of who they do that because it gives a lot of a lot of power and you want a board that's going to help you. So again, it's it goes right to choosing that right investor, having the right partner for you. But to, you know, I would say is um, keep watching shows like this. I know you have a whole series of things for early stage investors and, and entrepreneurs. Understanding the process makes it a whole lot less scary. It's one of the ways that you need you need to be able to raise money. It's a tough process to build your business and just like you need to understand what your market is for your products and who your customers are going to be, you need to understand who your investors are going to be and what's right and what's not in that process, and it'll help you a lot. Yeah, a lot of learning to have happen and a lot of opportunity to tap into uh, great minds and mentors and coaches and resources. Uh, we so, so appreciate you sharing your time and expertise with our audience. Thank you, Ford. Thank you, Mark. It's been a wonderful learning experience. And mostly I learned there's a lot more for us to learn um, as we work at Ramp with our companies. Um, you know, it, it's, there's so much good that happens when you guys give back in this way. And we so, so appreciate you. Thank you for being here.